people who have gone into space than have lived underwater. It's a really important mission because nothing has been done quite like this. Fabian Cousteau is leading a 31-day mission in the world's only underwater laboratory, Aquarius. And we're delighted to advise him on some really exciting science that's going to take place. There are four specific areas where Northeastern is working. The first is looking at the health of our oceans. How can we understand what state our oceans are in? The second is how can we use that information to live sustainably? Benefit from the ocean but not damage it. The third is how do we rekindle that sense of excitement in the next generation? And the fourth is celebrating the role of women in science. I heard a statistic the other day that only 22% of the aquanauts that have lived underwater have been women, so I can't wait to spread the word and hopefully inspire young women to join marine science. By having Liz living underwater, we can really get all these really good 24-hour measurements with the coral and study these giant sponges for a very long period of time. And you can't do that out of other platforms. And so we really get a good idea of what's going on with the human ocean connection through this project in urban coastal sustainability. Northeastern is dedicated to what we call use-inspired research, research focused on solving real-world problems. Climate change is a real-world problem. So this gives us an opportunity to, to engage in something that we're committed to and also to contribute to the fundamental knowledge. Well, good afternoon. How are you all doing today? Great. Welcome to the current science and technology stage here at the Museum of Science and our two o'clock special presentation. My name is David and I work here in the education department of the museum and we're really excited about what's going to be happening over the next hour or so. How many of you have heard of Fabian Cousteau's Mission 31 project? It's been in the news a lot. You're going to hear all about it. So I'm not going to talk to you uh, much about it except to introduce our uh, guest scientist who will talk and give an introductory uh, sort of uh, introduction to Mission 31 and then tell you to stick around because at 2.30 you're going to get a chance to talk to some of our aquanauts who are underneath the ocean. Um, so we're going to begin by hearing from Christopher Marks. Christopher is a marine biologist and an underwater photo photographer from the Marine Science Center uh, over at Northeastern uh, in the Nahant lab that they have. It's a beautiful space if you've never seen it. Um, and he's going to spend about 25 minutes or so telling us about the project. And if you've never heard of it, I think you're going to be really excited by both the amazing effort that's being led by Fabian Cousteau and the aquanauts down there and the really interesting science that uh, they're doing. And then after Chris is done, we're going to talk with the scientists and they'll tell us a little bit about some of the science that they've been working on and even share some of their findings because they only have a few days left in the habitat and they're starting to think about uh, even how this can uh, engender new science going forward. So let's uh, welcome Chris Marks, who's here from Northeastern, to give us an introduction to Mission 31. Hi, everyone. My name is Chris. Can you all hear me? Okay. Um, so I'm going to talk to you guys about Mission 31. Um, it's taking place in Key Largo, Florida, um, nine miles off the coast, um, in this underwater habitat, which you can see here, called Aquarius. Um, scientists are allowed to, or are able to live underwater and work underwater for usually up to two weeks. Um, but in this uh, historic mission, uh, scientists are living underwater for uh, an entire month, which is pretty awesome. So let's talk a little bit about it. Uh, first, uh, we have a lot of partners and collaborators I want to mention. Uh, we've got the Museum of Science, which is where we are today, Northeastern University, um, the Ocean Genome Legacy at Northeastern University, our Urban Coastal um, Sustainability Initiative. Um, the Habitat itself is run by Florida International University. Um, and then we've had some funding from Sexton Custom Underwater Products, uh, the National Science Foundation, Edgertronic, Cerigo, and uh, MIT. So what is Aquarius? Um, it is the world's only underwater laboratory that is still in existence. Um, and what it allows you to do is something called saturation diving. So when you do a normal scuba dive, which you use a piece of equipment like this, um, you're allowed to go underwater at this depth, which is about 60 feet, for up to an hour. Um, but when you saturate, um, so the reason you can't go longer than an hour is your body takes on nitrogen bubbles because there's great pressure underwater. Um, and you have to be able to get those bubbles back out of your blood and your tissues in order to not 
get sick or die. Um, so, but by saturating, you stay underwater and you live underwater, and it allows scientists to spend up to eight hours at a time in the water doing their research. So it's a really valuable tool, um, and it's also a lot of fun. Um, I was there this past week, so I just got back, and I'm really excited to tell you guys all about it. So Mission 31 um, is led by um, the grandson of Jacques Cousteau, who invented modern scuba diving. Um, and he also led the very first mission of this type um, in, uh, in a different underwater habitat called Con Shelf 3. Um, and they lived for 30 days underwater in the Red Sea. Um, to honor that memory 50 years later, uh, Fabian Cousteau is going to live for 31 days. So one day longer, and it will set a world record. So this is um, just kind of a view of what the habitat looks like and what the reef looks like around. Um, and now I'm going to show you a series of videos um, that kind of show what it's like to live and work around the habitat. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about the science that's going on. Um, and then we will meet with the actual aquanauts who are sitting in that laboratory right now waiting to talk to you guys. Seeing Aquarius for the first time today was just magical. It was awesome to be feeling like an astronaut with the hard hat and everything else and just gliding down to the inner space station. And just looking around, I mean, there's, there's divers, they're getting the, the habitat ready. The habitat itself has become a living reef. So you've got coral and crustacean around it. And tucked away in different parts and underneath the habitat, you've got lots of life around it. You know, it's out of this world and it's underwater and it, and there's, uh, it was magical, just really magical. Of course, all these things are in preparation for the big splashdown for Mission 31. We have another week to go before splashdown where we're going to be doing this every day for 31 days. I'm looking forward to it. So the next slide is another video um, showing how um, Liz McGee, who is the Northeastern University's dive uh, safety officer, um, is using one of these helmets you just saw in the last video. Uh, because the scientists underwater are spending so much time in the water, um, in, able, in, able, in order to be able to talk with the world and talk to each other, they wear these special dive helmets that have microphones, um, but they also require a lot of extra training. So this next video is showing how um, you can flood and then clear the mask, um, and she's pretty excited about it. So let's watch. So this next video um, is kind of a tour of a previous mission um, that happened in 2012. Um, some of the same scientists who are in the habitat now, um, Fabian, I believe, visited during this mission. Um, but this will got, give you guys a look inside the lab uh, before we see inside it live um, and kind of around the lab as well. Um, it's pretty awesome. Today our boat headed out to the Aquarius Reef Base where the aquanauts will live, work, eat and sleep on the ocean floor for the next seven days. I'm a technology and oceans reporter and when I heard Aquarius was having its last scheduled mission I had to check it out for myself. 
My dive buddies were Mark Ostrich from One World, One Ocean and Fabian Cousteau, the grandson of Jacques Cousteau. Fabian Cousteau is visiting Aquarius because his grandfather created the first underwater habitats 50 years ago. We were the first to visit the aquanauts and get a tour of the habitat as they moved into the new home. What is all this stuff? It's moving in day 20,000 millimeters under the sea, one of the coolest pieces of real estate on the planet. We just got here a few minutes ago and now we're moving in. You can see there's lots of action in the bunk room. A lot going on. There's a lot of pots coming down right now, all the electronics, and uh, I'm just eating a cracker. Uh, there's actually wireless internet access, so we're underwater and there's wireless internet access. You can surf the web. We also got a, a million dollar view out of this uh, prime piece of real estate. We eat our meals here. This is a, a wonderful place to, to take in the, the predator show at night. Um, but most of the time we're actually outside. That's, that's the whole purpose of this uh, underwater space station is not to be in it, but to be out on the reef doing our experiments and studying this wonderful coral reef. This is my third experience here. I hope not my last. It's like a dream come true. It's what little kids dream about. And here we are, we can be little kids realizing our dreams. It was a really unique experience interviewing Sylvia Earle in Aquarius. She's lived underwater nine times before this, and I think that makes her the most experienced of any aquanaut around. We need treatment for the bends. These are all valves to control the air and the habitat. These are all switches, almost like a breaker in your house. You do not want to hit that red button right there. Not, don't want to hit that button. Right here, you can see us. We're, that's actually the live webcam going out to the internet. Over here, we have our galley, and our sink. We got hot water, microwave. Somebody, uh, somebody was making mac and cheese there. So up here, we have uh, a lot of food. Yummy M&M's. That's not a plug for M&M's, but they are very, very good. We've, we've learned, you know, how to take showers and keep the habitat nice and dry, where to hang our towels, you know, Equinaut etiquette. <laughs> These doors all have O-ring seals. These are all sealing surfaces. We actually close these doors and pressurize the inside cabin here to a different pressure. This is where we'll decompress at the end of the mission. We'll bring the inside pressure all the way up to sea level with the door shut, and then we'll do a very short dive to the surface. Brian, we're gonna have to wrap it up. All right, one minute. The aquanauts can be down there for seven days straight because they're saturating, but since we're just scuba divers, we've only got an hour in the lab. And for that hour you have, it goes by so quick. Before you know it, it's just time to leave. Sylvia and the other aquanauts were gracious hosts, and I look forward to visiting them again. So one thing that you may have noticed about this video when you see the inside of the habitat is it's very small. Um, it's about the size of a school bus, and six people live inside. I um, mean, right now, six people are living inside for a month, so you can imagine how tired they may be getting of each other at this point. Um, this is the last week of the mission. Um, but it's pretty awesome to be that close to everything and to have windows to look out and see fish swimming by while you eat your dinner. It's pretty awesome. So there's a bunch of different science um, that's happening underwater um, in various different themes. So I'm going to give you guys a quick overview of what's going on. Um, and then when we go live to the aquanauts um, and scientists underwater, they're going to go in depth a little bit more and give some actual results from the data that they've collected on this trip. Um, so we're going to talk about um, corals and environmental stress, um, environmental contaminant exposure, uh, sponge feeding activity, the health of reef zooplankton, which are the tiny little particles that float around in the water. Uh, they can be both animal and plant. Um, and then um, Ocean Genome Legacy's um, sponge DNA collection. So we'll talk just a little bit about all that, um, and then we'll go live to the scientists.
So corals, um, coral reefs are kind of in decline around the world um, due to all sorts of different things, um, mostly due to human pollution. Um, uh, we're polluting the atmosphere and it's causing the oceans to warm and turn more acidic. Um, and so corals are really stressed out right now. Um, and reefs look vastly different than they did even 20 years ago. Um, and so one thing that scientists are looking at is um, how uh, corals can respond to stress. And by being underwater um, for the, uh, an entire month, we can look at the lunar cycle and how it affects coral uh, physiology. Um, we can also look at um, things 24-7, which you can't do normally. Um, and so the scientists have these, they've got these cool probes that they can stick inside each little coral mouth um, and they can measure the oxygen and the pH level and get a physiological reading for the health of these corals in real time, 24-7, um, which is really valuable data. Um, so this is an example of what that probe system looks like. You can see there's a little glass probe in the top left picture, um, and it, it is inside one of the coral polyps or mouth, um, and that probe is measuring either oxygen or pH, um, and then they can do different sorts of treatments, and they can see how the corals respond. Um, so one thing of particular interest is when the oceans warm, how will the coral physiology change? And we've seen some pretty interesting results so far. And that's what I just said. Uh, one other thing uh, we're interested in looking at is environmental contamination. Um, things like uh, PCBs, which are polychlorinated biphenols. Um, they come from a lot of factory dumping. Um, in the past, factories living near the coast, they just dump their waste into the ocean. Um, and so there's a lot of pollution in certain areas. Um, PAHs are polyaromatic hydrocarbons. I believe that comes from oil drilling. Um, and dispersants from something like the BP oil spill, which was nearby to Key Largo. So um, we've got some equipment out on the reef um, to kind of help see what kinds of organic pollutants are in the water um, so we can assess the overall health of the coral reefs in the Florida Keys. Um, so here's an example of what they look like. Um, actually, I'm going to go back one slide. Um, so there's a couple kinds of things we've got out on the water. We've got these little absorbent paper-like strips that we've tied to mostly to lines with buoys and cinder blocks. Um, and if, there is, if these pollutants are in the water, they will actually get stuck on these absorbent filters, and then we can measure them later in the lab. Um, and then this is what it actually looks like out on the reef. You can see the cinder block with the buoy, um, and then they've, uh, they're attaching things um, to look at them. So sponges are some of the oldest multicellular organisms on the planet. Um, and not much is known about them because their biology is really hard to study. Um, so we've got a team of scientists who are working on this particular sponge, Zesta spongia muta. Um, it's a pretty big sponge that's pretty abundant. Um, and we're trying to figure out kind of the bioenergetics of this sponge. And basically that means they take water, they filter all the water on the coral reef um, every 24 to 48 hours it gets filtered by these sponges on a coral reef. So they're really important for keeping the water clean and healthy. Um, and so the scientists are looking at what kinds of, like how efficient they can take things out of the water as well as if they're entrapping things like plastic or pollutants. Um, and we've got some cool results from that as well, which I'm pretty sure we'll talk about live in a minute. There it goes. And we've got a short video on the sponges. Coral reefs are the rainforests of the sea. This ecosystem may be our best hope for the cure for cancer, heart disease, and a host of other human ailments. We may find these drugs on the reef. So today what we're doing is we're, we're making some measurements from the day boat using scuba diving. We're taking a water quality instrument called an XO2, and this is a really cool device that's got uh, all manner of probes that can measure dissolved oxygen and pH and the temperature and the salinity of the water. And one thing we're going to try today for the first time is, is using it as a probe to measure the metabolism of some barrel sponges on the reef. Sponges are the, the oldest multicellular life on the planet. 
All the water on the coral reef passes through the body of a sponge every 24 to 48 hours. The sponge communities are really important on the reef. They're a, a really valuable uh, filter. As anybody who has a home pool knows, your pool will go green if you don't have a good filter cleaning the water in it. Sponges play a really important role in that those hard bottoms of the spurs are really where the sponges and the corals want to take hold. Sponges really like to have a, a nice hard substrate to anchor onto. So we're going to be looking at some of those areas and try to see if we can get a sense of, of what their preferred substrate environments are. Maybe we can find new medicines out there, new ways to treat uh, diseases, even new engineering systems for, for filtering or help develop reef systems in other places. So it really makes it exciting. It would be a tragedy if we you know, lost the cure for cancer because we lost the components of the ecosystem. So that's why it's important to understand the functioning of the entire ecosystem and protect it because our well-being is at stake as a species. So another uh, area that we're studying while we're down there is um, the zooplankton health. Um, very little is known about the zooplankton of a coral reef other than that it rises out of the corals and off the bottom of the ocean at nighttime. Um, so if you go, has, is anybody here a scuba diver? Have you guys ever done a night dive? And you see like so many more things in the water at nighttime, right? So. I mean, we know that it's there, but not a lot of work has been done to try and figure out what it is or how healthy it is. And so um, by being down underwater for 31 days, uh, we can go from full moon to full moon and we can see how the lunar cycle affects the zooplankton um, and we can figure out what kinds of zooplankton are there. Um, and it's really pretty awesome. Um, so here's a video. Um, and it's just going to play in the background while I talk because the audio is not very good. Uh, but this is inside the galley of the Aquarius habitat, and you can see they're filming the zooplankton is attracted by light, um, which is why when you do a night dive and you have your dive light, things are flying at your face because they're coming towards the light that you're holding. Um, but you can see they've got a light in the window, and that window is just filled with all sorts of tiny little things, and you can see larger fish swimming by trying to eat them um, because the zooplankton are really important for many, many fish species out there, um, and they kind of provide the basis of food uh, for a lot of the fish that live there. Um, so it's pretty cool. I'm actually going to cut this a little short because it's pretty long. Uh, so the last bit of science that Northeastern is involved with um, is uh, with our new partner, Ocean Genome Legacy. Um, they are a biorepository. They're basically going out and collecting DNA, f they're trying to collect DNA from all of the organisms that live in the ocean um, that we can have for posterity, for experimentation, um, possibly for drug research. Um, and so what they do is they go out and they collect organisms and they preserve their DNA. Um, and we can answer all sorts of questions with that DNA. Um, and here's a short video that kind of explains that. Our oceans are the next frontier in scientific discovery. They contain species that have survived millions of years that can provide genetic data to help us better understand our environment and even cure disease. Researchers here at Northeastern University are solving global challenges in health security and sustainability with particular emphasis on urban coastal sustainability. Our marine science faculty and students are pursuing knowledge from the depths of the ocean to the coasts of continents and in our state-of-the-art labs. Part of their journey is now rooted in an amazing partnership between Northeastern and Ocean Genome Legacy, a public biorepository of DNA samples from ocean life. A physical database of the world's rarest, strangest, and most remarkable ocean creatures that's now right here at Northeastern in our Marine Science Center. This biorepository provides an unprecedented wealth of knowledge for our research faculty, students, and scientists around the globe. An infinite world of discovery is waiting below the ocean's surface. And thanks to OGL, that world is now accessible in our labs.
All right, so it's just about time to meet the aquanauts who are living underwater, um, but they're not quite ready for us. I guess I talk too fast. Um, so one thing I can say is um, there are six aquanauts who are underwater. We'll be talking with two of them, um, Grace Young, who is in the top left there, um, and Liz McGee. Um, and then we're going to talk with two of our scientists who have been diving, uh, scuba diving from the surface. Um, so we're waiting for them to actually get down into the habitat. Um, they have to treat their entrance into the habitat just like a regular scuba dive. Um, so they're going to have about an hour to spend inside before they have to go back up um, for safety reasons. Um, so in the meantime, while we're waiting, um, does anybody have any questions about scuba diving, saturation diving, the Aquarius habitat, Mission 31? Um, yeah. How do they get in and out of the Aquarius without the water going in? So if you didn't the question, it was how do they get in and out of Aquarius without the water going in? That's a great question. So um, in one of the earlier videos, um, there's this thing called a moon pool. Um, so the air inside the habitat is at the same pressure as the water. Um, so when you're actually down there, um, and I experienced this because I got to go inside myself, um, the air is twice as thick um, as it is in this room that we're in now. And so everything, like your voice sounds a little bit like a chipmunk, um, which is kind of weird when you get down there. Um, so by keeping the pressure, it uh, um, keeps the water outside, but there is this thing called a moon pool, which is kind of a hole in the floor, um, and the air pressure inside kind of keeps the water from coming up that hole into the habitat, and so you just swim underneath the habitat, and then you climb the stairs up inside. Any other questions? Okay. Why do they... Uh get in the habitat? So the question is, why do they go in the habitat? Um, for the people who are living there, it's so that they don't have to go back up to the surface, um, and that allows them to um, stay out in the water for up to eight hours a day um, doing work. Um, for the people who visit, um, it's more of a visit, um, but also it allows us to see what it's like and to communicate with the world like we're doing today. Um, and I think at this point, uh, we're ready to meet with them. Uh, they're down in there. So we're going to meet with Liz McGee, Grace Young, um, Dr. Mark Patterson, and Francis Choi. Sorry, Brian Helmuth. So we're just going to try to get our aquanauts up on the screen here. Let's give us one second to do that. We're starting to see them. Can you guys hear us OK? All right, we're just getting you up on the screen here, full screen, so everybody will see you. Hey! Hey! There we go, so you can see it. You guys can wave to our aquanauts, and we're going to get them up on the screen so we can see them. Hi, Mom! Hi, Alex! I don't know if they can see us, at least. Can you guys hear us? Yes, we can hear you great. So I see that we have Brian Helmuth, uh, we have Francis Choi, uh, both Hello. from Northeastern University, and then we have Liz McGee from the Northeastern Three Seas program who is in, oh yeah, there's Mark Patterson in the window there behind us. Liz is in a unique situation because for all of these conversations we've had to date, she's been outside swimming around, but she's going to get a chance to uh, actually see and answer some questions from people here, and, and her husband and mom are actually here in the audience, so do you want to wave to them, Liz? Hi, Mom. <laughs> and then we have Grace Young from MIT, who has also been uh, one of the saturation divers who's been swimming around outside, although we've been lucky enough to have her join us once or twice during the program. So uh, what we can do, maybe do you guys want to go around and just kind of introduce yourselves and tell us a little bit about what you've been up to over the last, uh, you know, uh, 10 days or so at this point, um, and then uh, tell us a little bit about what you've been finding, and we can intersperse some questions with the audience as we go, uh, you know, uh, so that everybody has a chance to sort of hear what's going on. That'd be great. I mean, I think what we were wanting to do is, is kind of wrap up what we've been doing. I mean, I say wrap up, but we were just talking about the fact we're kind of panicked that we only have a couple of days here left. We've been collecting a ton of data, um, but none of us are quite ready for it to end. Um, I just want to say we're probably going to get a couple more people visiting from behind, so we've got a huge team down here. Um, so you just saw Amanda and Mark. We've got Sarah 
and Nick and Allie. Allie coming down, and then Morgan is back on shore, our team blogger. Hello, Morgan. Um, She's probably watching right now. Yeah. Hey, Morgan. Um, but it's been great. I mean, I want to turn it over to these guys. I mean, they're the ones you want to talk to, but um, we've been finding some really cool stuff yeah. and stuff that we never expected. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, it, tell us what you went up to. It's been incredible. I I've been saying over and over how quickly the time has been going by. It, I can't even explain that. Each day feels like maybe a few hours. It's just flown by. We're now at the end of the mission with only one more dive day left, and each day has been jam packed with science and outreach, and it's just been such an incredible experience. That's great. Um, Let me people, just say one thing real quick, which is that sure. you guys sound fantastic. So that's great that you're talking right to the computer, and I would encourage you to continue to do that so we hear you great. Okay, good. Okay, thanks. I was just going to say, I don't know if, how many people have been following us along. We have a bunch of blogs, and, and these guys are live. Um, but Grace has these amazing Entertronic photos that yeah. everybody should look at. And yeah. I've, been, I've been looking at them over and that's over so again. Cool. They're finding such awesome. cool things. Yeah. Yeah, we brought down this high speed video camera underwater for the first time. It's called the Entertronic Camera, and it just came out, I guess, six weeks ago now. And we had a uh, custom built underwater housing made for it. And we've been using it to film the behavior of fish, and shrimps, Christmas tree worms, creatures down here that move ultra fast, like so fast that you look at it and just in the blink of an eye they'll change. We filmed them in slow motion so we can really understand their behavior better. It's really fascinating. How slow do you film them in? We can film up to 18,000 frames a second. Huh. Most of our videos uh -huh. are yeah, most of our videos are at a thousand frames a second. That's, that's, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, I mean one of the things we've really been trying to do, all of us top setting down here, is share everything that we're doing with you back there. So Francis has been really yeah. instrumental in doing that. I mean he's he's creating virtual tours and we just last night got them to work that hopefully oh, we can share them with the Museum of Science. Maybe in the planetarium, but they just started working last night. Do you want to tell them a little bit? Yeah, we've been putting out these things called three sixty GoPros. There are six GoPros all attached to one little structure. Basically, you can have a live 360 video going on. You can zoom in and out, you can move around, you can basically be at Aquarius, just like we are. So I got them to work yesterday, which is great. We have four to five videos to be live up on the Helmut Lapsa. Yeah, yeah, about an hour and a half each. Yeah, yeah. Francis, if people want to see some of the stuff that you guys are talking about, like those uh, high-speed videos that Grace has been filming with the marine organisms or some of the things that you've been uh, doing with the GoPro video cameras, what's the best way for them to sort of keep on top uh, of what's going on and, and where should they look for those kinds of things? Well, Grace has a Twitter account, and yeah, so a lot of the videos is on her Twitter account. I, I think kind of the, the all stop. In, in one place shops are mission31.com, it's mission-31.com, yeah, um, and then if you go to northeastern slash uh, mission31 as well, um, we've been collating things there. So, so Fabian has an amazing group of cinematographers down here that are making production quality videos every single day, and so um, those are archived on the Mission 31 website. It's just, I've been blown yeah, away by yeah. how fast, really high quality stuff has turned around. Yeah, and some amazing. of the best footage is even being saved for the documentary film that should come out in a year or so. It's going to be. We got a chance to see just a snippet of that in the introductory video that our audience watched before we started, and uh, it really is stunning footage. Uh, and Chris, who's an underwater photographer, told us a little bit about sort of some of the gear that's actually being used there, and, and it's amazing. Maybe could you guys just tell us a little bit, Chris did a wonderful job of sort of introducing us to some of the science themes that are happening uh, right now. He told us about sensing for entire environmental contamination or looking at the yeah. energy budget of things like these big barrel sponges or looking at things like coral reef health. He talked about a whole bunch of things. Can you tell us a little bit about what you've been up to, both sort of, uh, you know, with the saturation divers and all the help that you've been getting from above and some of the things that you've started to uncover and find and where that might lead you for future expeditions? Um, I can kind of give an overview. These yeah. guys will give you details. I mean, one of the, the really cool things about um, the Florida Keys and, and concrete in particular is there are these things called internal waves that come in. And so it's, it's, think of it as it's like a thermocline of the ocean where you, you go from warm water to cold water, <laughs> only it's horizontal. And so as you're swimming along, you'll have two to five degree changes just from one place to the other when you're swimming. So these kind of cold water blurbs are coming in and off the reef. Um, and we really don't know how those are affecting corals 
and sponges, but one of the things we're looking at is here's this great place where temperatures are changing naturally. Can we use that to understand what um, climate change is likely to do? So Ali Matzel, um, a graduate student with our group, is looking at, um, I think as Chris told you about these, the sponge physiology. Um, one of the things we think is going on is you get these cold water blurbs that come in and the sponges just act as collectors. And so all this cold water just sits in the sponges, shuts them down, they can't get rid of it. Um, and so even these brief events are having a, a big effect. But it's just it's a fantastic natural environment to, to study changes in things like temperature and nutrients because they're, they're kind of changing on such short scales here. Um, and the fact that these guys are down here constantly lets us do things that we never could have done otherwise. Yeah. I mean, as far as troubleshooting, I mean, I let you guys <laughs> tell us, but it's none of this is easy. Yeah, yeah it's been um, it's been really fun to communicate with these guys via text and FaceTime every evening to make a working plan for the next dive day, and then we always have to run through everything that we did the next day because with diving and doing science, it never goes according to plan. So the troubleshooting that we have done has been really fun and. And we're now like really efficient with the things that we're doing. Like this morning, yeah. I sent Brian's team a text message about the tripod that had fallen over overnight, and so we set it back up. But if we were doing just surface diving, we wouldn't have the ability to go down there. Uh, we wouldn't know that our instruments might have gotten this place, right. so it would have been reading incorrect data. Whereas we're here, we have the ability to see it and to fix it on the spot, real time. It's really cool. And one of the things that they've been doing is they've been doing plankton tones basically mm -hmm. throughout the day, which is something we can't do because we're on top side. So we have to dive in once a day to do it. Where yeah, the traps you see right there yeah. on the side. Yeah. So maybe Wire is mm -hmm. going to get a thesis chapter out of it because yeah. of you guys. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so there's there's a lot of things being saturated that you can't do when we're as they call us the unsaturated. Unsaturated. Yeah. The unsaturated. <laughs> So when you guys are out there on those long dive runs, I mean, can you tell us a little bit about what the extra time allows you to do just in terms of the people that actually have to go out there and fix whatever might be broken or, um, you know, what does that actually afford to you? I know you said that you just have extra time, but what sort of things are you actually doing when you're out on those long dive runs that would be so difficult otherwise? Yeah. Well, one thing is during we're we're working at about 60 feet. So on a surface dive, you can only spend maybe 45 minutes working at that depth. But while we're saturation diving, we can spend six hours at that depth. So the Edgertronic camera, for example, it took us it take it took us at first an hour to set up the camera, and then it takes us like 15 minutes to get the shot. So we there's no way we could do that with a surface dive. There's not enough time. Um, now we've gotten it down so it's about a half hour set up and then use 15 minutes to get the right shot. But like if we were surface diving coming up and down, you know, we would just never have time to even set up the camera and see what we're able to see. Hey, one thing, just to give you a sense of what we're talking about, one of the things that the Morgan has been tasked with is, is to calculate the total bottom time of these guys. It's hundreds and hundreds of hours. And if you convert that into what it would take somebody topside, during a typical 10-day mission, it's usually a couple months. Yeah. So after a 31-day mission, um, if that's, I would guess, it's easily over a year, two years, yeah. and it's collecting data that never would have been collected otherwise right. because it's right. over an entire cycle. I mean, a couple days ago, I think the coral started spawning. Yeah. Exactly. And these guys were down here. Um, we've got the data, and you know, it just would have been dumb luck otherwise. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's cool. We, I, I think Grace and I spent a little time guesstimating, so it's interesting to hear the one to two years, because we were like, yeah. maybe six months or something Oh, like I think that. a lot but more than that, that. yeah. So too. Just like wow. the opportunity cost. I mean, the research we're doing in two weeks is taking a team of you know, 20 people yeah, and the top a dozen side. people topside researchers all working together to get the research done right now in these two weeks. So yeah. if, if the audience didn't really understand what Grace was talking about there, she was talking about the infrastructure that supports them to be able to do this work, not only about the electricity and the air and all the other stuff that they have, but the people that they have actually supporting them with dives that you know don't have umbilical lines, but rather scuba divers who are only down there for a short amount of time. I guess maybe either Brian or Francis, could one of you guys tell us a little bit about what it's like to try to support the mission from that perspective and what you have to do because you have so little time compared to the luxury of time that, that people like Grace and, and Liz have when they're saturated in the diving environment. 
Yeah, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of sleepless <laughs> night. We we work quite a bit. We go home after we dive, and we we just keep working. We do three dives a day, and yeah. We do three dives a day. Actually, someone's swimming by right now. Really <laughs> Our surface team is kind of photo bobbing us here, but yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's uh, it's long and hard work, but it's fun as well. Like I'm, I'm kind of not looking forward to coming back to Boston because the water is <laughs> No so offense, everybody. Yeah, no offense. I love Boston. Yeah, we all love Boston. Yeah. I can't, I'm gonna, I can't wait to be back in next week before it's July. Yeah, yeah but that's gonna be awesome. awesome. Yeah. Make sure you guys um, are talking to the computer. Would it be okay for us to take maybe one or two questions and then we can get yeah, back to absolutely. some of the science? Is there anyone that has a question for our Aquanauts? Come on up, maybe they'll be able to see you if you come stand right in front of the computer there. Tell us what your name is and what your question is for our Aquanaut. Hi, Dr. Helmuth. This is Gabrielle. I'm Dr. Grace's student from SCS. Hey, how are you? Hi. Good to <laughs> see you, you guys, again. Um, have you seen any stranger down there? I'm just curious. Any anything? No, like that? actually, I don't. Have you guys no. seen a stranger? I don't think so. Um, I, not that I've noticed. I mean, we we topside. We've done a couple of dives at other sites just to look around. We have a we have a day off every Friday, but. We still go and snorkel other places. Um, so we went to, to some sites that had a lot of soft corals um, and some, some diversity that we don't see here. But I haven't seen anything like that. No, stranger. OK, my other question is, um, as far as future studies and like monitoring, and you know this habitat's going to be down there, where do you see that research heading You know, five years or 10 years from now? Because you, know, you guys are going to be involved with this for the rest of your life, I'm assuming, right? So where do you, where do you yeah. see this going? I'll, I'll let these guys chime in too, but for me, um, a, a lot of our team focuses on using engineering as well as biology. So Mark Patterson's group, for example, um, develops a, a lot of really delicate instrumentation. Um, where I see this going is um, fitting the reef with enough sensors that we can get an idea of what's going on, but the key is that you have to understand the biology and to know where to put all these sensors. So we can measure temperature, we can measure water flow. These guys have been um, putting out um, instruments to measure um, water quality, measure salinity, but they're big, they're wheel unwieldy, um, and so I think working hand in hand with engineers to me is is a way to really start figuring out how rapidly things are changing. I'm sure what you guys have yeah. to say? Yeah, the ocean environment is really challenging to work in. We're just sixty feet deep, um, but um, I can't imagine what it would be like working at even 100 feet or 200 feet, and uh -huh. most of the ocean is, well, the average depth of the ocean is what? Very deep. Okay. It's like thousands <laughs> of feet, so it's pitch black there. Mile, yeah. Right now, we do still rely on a lot of sunlight from the sun, and there's so much pressure. I mean, we still need a lot of support from the surface. You know, divers come down every day to visit us, do medical checkups, bring us food and towels, so... We're, we're just barely comfortable working at 60 feet. I can't imagine what there's left to discover, or how we would even discover in the deep sea. Yeah, you guys have heard this over and over again, I'm sure, but, you know, we've, we've explored more of the surface of the moon than we have the bottom of the ocean. And so, you know, we're, we're exploring this one little area very well because of, of this technology, but, you know, this is a teeny tiny little part of it, yeah. and it's all that we have no clue what's going on. You, you know, but, there's uh, a question that, that comes up related to the excellent first question that we heard. Um, we can take another question from the audience in a minute or two, but, but it made me, uh, I got a question when talking about this earlier today from someone. We mentioned that, uh, you know, Aquarius is the only remaining underwater marine habitat, and that, uh, you know, it's now overseen by Florida International University because it's lost some of its federal funding. What do you okay. think the future is for Aquarius? What, what needs to happen if it's going to continue uh, sort of being uh, the resource that it is and maybe even transforming into some of the stuff that you guys are talking about before, uh, besides doing, uh, you know, that would involve doing more complex and, and long-term science? Yeah, I mean, we were all really grateful when FIU took this over. Mark Patterson, in particular, worked with Sylvia Earle to try to save Aquarius because they know what an amazing facility this is. And so FIU taking it over really, literally kept it from becoming an underwater um, <laughs> artificial reef. Yeah. Um, what the future holds, I mean, I think they're still trying to figure this out. Yeah. I mean, they stepped in and um, are, are working to save it. Um, but there's still a lot to figure out. I think I that, there, yeah, things like Mission 31 need to happen because the more people who find out about this incredible, unique working environment, the more people will care about it and the more likely that it will survive. So my hope is that Mission 31 might be the first of this type of mission and more and more people will learn about 
uh, the possibilities of the science and, and things you can learn while in Aquarius, and it will be a more commonly used workspace. Yeah. We need people who are interested in, in learning about the oceans and saving the oceans, and then we need like, you know, support from smart people, and, and we need mm -hmm. funding for ocean research, mm -hmm. I guess. And, and we need communicators, too. Yeah, I mean, exactly. So much of this, I mean, that's, to me, what has blown me away working with Fabian in this group, is, is yeah. the ability to share what we kind of, you know, start take it for granted. I mean, yeah. you know, I've, I've done a couple of desaturation missions, and, and I would never say it gets to be old hat, but, um, you know, it's it's a really, really amazing facility. Um, but the other thing is, is that this is a great place, but there's so many other places that we could explore. I mean, right where you guys are sitting, right in Boston Harbor in the Gulf of Maine, there are all these unexplored areas that even if we don't end up saturation diving, you know, there are a host of fleet of submersibles. Um, Mark Patterson's group works on autonomous underwater vehicles, um, and we're out there diving all the time. It, it, we're never going to run out of stuff to do. Yeah. Mission 31 is a great outreach, too, as well. Yeah. Just like yeah. we grew up watching Jacques Cousteau and his movies. Yeah. yeah. And now, hopefully, in the future, kids will watch up. I grew up watching Mission 31 and their stories as well. Yeah, I know my daughter Morgan, who I mentioned before, has been watching all both Jacques Cousteau and Jean Michel Cousteau's and, and the movies that uh, Celine and, and Fabian have made as well. So she's she's gotten caught up to speed, and she's as jazz as, as I was when I was her age, which really does my heart a lot of good. Yeah, I think this for me, the most important lesson that I've learned is that if if you're doing the science and nobody knows about it, it's basically like not doing the science. But yeah. with this incredible reach to reach hundreds of millions of people, it really helps spread the word about what needs to be done, what is being done, and how to keep doing it. And so, to me, outreach is one of the most important yeah. parts of this yeah. whole, whole thing. Both yep. Grace and Liz have wonderful blogs. You can read uh, their accounts yep. uh, for the last few days of the mission. And also, if you go to the Mission 31 website that Brian mentioned earlier, you can actually sort of spy on them. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so those of us that have been uh, you know, associated with the program uh, have been watching a lot of them in the galley and the kitchen, both having conversations or doing other programs yep. like this, or maybe just replenishing themselves from all their hard work swimming around. Is there another question from the audience? See, let's have you. You want to come on up so they can see you? Uh, we'll get to you next, I promise. Say, come on up. You can wave to our, our aquanauts there. What's your name? Um, uh, Aaron. Uh, I'm just going to say this is a slightly silly question before I ask it. Uh, takes on SpongeBob. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> um, I, well, my take on SpongeBob is, is he's probably extremely old, despite the way he acts. So some of these yeah. sponges we're working on down here, Joe Pollock's group at, at Wilmington is estimated they could live to be 2,000 years old, and that the sponges around us are at least a couple of year, hundred years old. So they probably mature very, very slowly, um, which I think would be my take on SpongeBob. Yeah. Yeah. We actually have this program called OGL at uh, Northeastern University, and they're collecting 14 different species of sponges, and they look nothing like SpongeBob. They're all yeah. really, really cool looking, though. Yeah. I still love the SpongeBob cartoon. Yeah, I, yeah. And my background is in engineering, and, but right now we're doing a lot of work with like, plankton toes, collecting samples of plankton. And now that I've learned a lot more about plankton, even despite that, I still think of that little character in SpongeBob whenever I think of plankton. <laughs> Thank you. We have one more question from the audience, and then maybe we can talk to you guys a little more. Do you want to come on up? What's your name and what's your question? Hi, my name is Francesca. Um, I wanted to know the data you are acquiring is already defined for the own mission, what you are acquiring, or is it an interactive process with the faculty? So it's a back and forth, depending on what you find they require to take new data. That's yeah. a great question. If you didn't hear the question, I'll just repeat it for the audience. Uh, Francesca's question was, did you already decide before you got down there all the data that you would be collecting? Or are you sort of changing your plan as the time goes, depending on what you've collected and, and what you're finding thus far? That's a really great question. Um, even though we have the ability to stay in the water as long as we do, we still have to, we still have to pre-plan everything that we're doing as far as the equipment and the technology that we're using. So our science goals, we have five main science goals that we really focused on while we've been down here. But that being said, especially with the Edgertronic camera, we have been focusing on different species and we've been, even we've moved from um, 
organisms to more like bubbles, for example, instead. Mm -hmm. So we've been able to be flexible in, in, in that way, but in general for, for our science goals, we've maintained those goals pretty rigidly because of the difficulty of doing work underwater. Yeah, I mean, to another answer to your question is, um, Mark and I are both faculty members of Northeastern and have the grad students above, and so we've been able to take the instruments that they've been putting out, download the data, and look at it, and already in the last two weeks, we've changed our idea of what to expect down here, um, just based on what the, we're collecting. And so I, I think if I'm understanding what you're asking, we are, we're having to be pretty nimble. Um, I mean, in some ways, we knew we were going to test based on measurements we had in the lab and previous work down here. But in other ways, um, we're heading in totally new directions that we had no idea of two and a half weeks ago. Yeah. And as a lab tech, I, we packed everything with us. Me, <laughs> and so one really good example was like one day Brian swam by a sponge and stuck his head into a barrel sponge. And it was really cold. So we yeah. decided to put out loggers down, check out the temperature inside the sponge and outside the sponge. Yeah. And that way we do little manipulations in between, but we would still focus on the five main objectives yeah. of, uh, of the mission. Yeah, it's almost like measuring reef health like you're a doctor. Um, where a doctor starts to give you a physical, but then she notices something that is a little bit different, and it takes her on a, a completely different direction. I mean, we, we've got the, the basic ideas that we keep coming back to, but how we ask those things, what instruments we use, it, it's really flexible. Um, it's, I mean, as Francis said, we're up at every night till easily midnight. You know, Francis is probably up to 1 in the morning with, with Sarah downloading instruments for the faculty to sleep. But yeah. <laughs> What's the most exciting finding that each of you have sort of found emerging so far, the thing that gets you most excited and wishes that you made you wish that you had two more weeks down there? <laughs> oh, wow. oh, that's hard. That is a really hard question. Um, I don't know, some of your Edgetronic stuff. Yeah. I mean, I've gotten yeah. really excited by that. Yeah, yeah I know with Marcus. The camera, yeah. you know, sometimes it's just luck, like being with the camera set up and then the creature being right in front of you. And so, you know, we can't, like, always find the creatures we want to film. They're not always cooperating. We just need a lot of time with them. So if I had two more weeks, that's definitely what I would do. I would like follow around and group birds and creatures <laughs> with the camera. <laughs> So we, if, if you in the audience don't know exactly what Grace is talking about, you might have seen those really exciting pictures of uh, high-speed photography of drops of milk or water coming out of a tap or insects flying, where you can capture details uh, with these high-speed photographic methods that you could never, ever see, even with you know computer-aided sort of human eye type of photography. And, and so what... Uh, Grace is talking about is some of the stuff that's emerging from the research that she's been doing with this uh, stuff under the camera. Can you tell us a little bit about what you are trying to do with the groupers? I remember everyone talking about groupers and, and how you can learn new things about what's going on inside of them. Yes. Yeah. So the, um, well, do you want me to tell you that? Okay. So there is a uh, fish down here called the Goliath grouper. It's a little over 300 pounds. There's three of them that have been they swim around the habitat. habitat. They live yeah. here. Yeah, yeah. Huge fish, and they feed in a really interesting way. They have huge jaws, and when they want to catch a fish, they open their jaws so wide that it actually dislocates its jaw, and then it can create a vacuum, and inside of the vacuum is a small bubble that forms, called a cavitation bubble, that expands and contracts like in the blink of an eye. And you can, you can feel it. Liz was written right next to the fish yesterday yeah. as it did this like boom yeah it just like goes right through you you can feel it in your chest in your in like your lungs basically passing right through you I was about three feet from one yesterday when she did it she was staring oh, right really? at his mouth yeah, it's just oh wow incredible but it happens so fast we can't see it with human eyes but we can see it with this uh, high-speed camera yeah. So that would, that's like a dream if we could catch <laughs> the that. million dollar shot. The million yeah, dollar yeah, shot. Yeah, yeah. Two years down and here. Yeah, I don't think, <laughs> you know, I think we're, <laughs> I don't know if we're going to get it this trip, but <laughs> we have for the first time used this high speed camera underwater, so we're getting close. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I think we've all come up with probably 10 research projects that we wish we could start next week. I mean, I know you guys are going to go up and get a cheeseburger <laughs> and you know, spend a couple of days to your families and then go back down again. But to me, I mean, at, at Northeastern, um, you probably see some of the signs around you. We're working on this urban coastal sustainability initiative, and the whole idea is that people live as part of the ecosystem around them. It's not something separate, and this is about the ultimate example yeah. of this. 
but we're all focused on climate change, but we kind of forget is that it's climate that's training the weather. I mean, nobody, no single organism cares about a two degree temperature increase. They care because that creates heat waves or it creates hurricanes or short term events. The same thing is going on down here. And so um, there's, there's a lot going on of these short time scales that really impact organisms that you may miss. So um, to me, again, it's just exciting to try to figure out if we want to understand nature, how do we become part of it enough so that we know how to predict how it's going to respond to all these changes we're seeing. Yeah. Maybe it's Sorry, another question. Sorry, we're sticking to the charger here, which is what's going on. Yeah. <laughs> Any, another there question from the audience, really maybe? He's talking again. Yeah. No. Go ahead, David. Hi. Does any in the audience have another question for our aquanauts? No, okay, I'll ask one then. Um, one question I had is, is during the video where we uh, saw previous versions of uh, uh, the Aquarius mission um, and people climbing in, there was this amazing section where, you know, we saw Liz stand up and look around at the environment inside, and there was this sort of amazing line where the water stopped and the air began. How do they yeah. do that? Is it just because of the air pressure, or is there something else that they do to make it that the water sort of stops where it stops? And how would they deal with that if it didn't work the way it was supposed to work? Yeah, that's a great question. Oh, I think we got Fabian. Oh, there's Fabian. Fabian. Still, everyone wave hi to Fabian. <laughs> <laughs> hi. Oh, there's oh, a sister, Celine. Oh, nice. She came into the habitat earlier today. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Thanks, guys. You want to answer? Yeah, it's like a if, if you've ever turned a cup upside down in your in your kitchen sink, and it's got that pocket of air that sits in there. That's generally the real basic way that they keep this place from uh, filling with water, for example. But they also have air constantly pumping in here to keep the pressure difference positive in here, um, so that the water cannot rise. Also, they have these incredibly high-tech hatch doors that they seal off if there is ever any instance where that might happen. Um, yeah, that's my short answer. Yeah, no, I mean, I think of it as a cup that Liz talked about with a straw inserted in it where you're yeah. constantly blowing a little bit of, of air into it. Yeah. I mean, if, if shutting off the doors, I don't think you guys have any storms while you're down here, no. but if you get storms, that, that moon pool, the surface of the water will slosh up and down as the waves pass over and the pressure changes. And it really starts messing with your ears, and so they, they lock off the end so that you're essentially in a submarine and you don't feel that pressure change out there. Yeah. Um, but it's just, it's, it can get pretty dynamic in here, I yeah. think. Yeah. We've got some new people filtering in, so I'm just going to tell them what's going on since they see these faces of these happy people in this capsule here. Uh, we see a bunch of uh, aquanauts uh, from Northeastern University and MIT, uh, as well as the, the topside scuba divers who have been helping them. And they're talking to us about Aquarius, which is their uh, underwater habitat that Liz and Grace have been living in for over a week now. Um, and there's just a couple of, of days left in the mission. So one question I wanted to ask is, um, I guess it's a little similar to what our, our previous question was, is there anything that you haven't gotten to really focus on yet that you really are hoping to cram into the remaining time that you have, knowing that this is such special, limited time uh, to spend your long diving runs in the water? What do you really want to make sure you didn't miss out on? I, I, all I know is we've been pretty busy in the water, and so <laughs> the chance to just walk around in that helmet and just gaze while I'm yeah. here and soak it all up is my aim for, for the last little bits of diving that I've got left. It's funny, I was going to say the same thing, because we've been on some dives where there's always a task, there's always something to get done, and it's just one dive I think Francis and I were making when he was finishing something up, and I had nothing to do, and I was just I was sitting there, I was actually starting to pay attention to what's going on around me. I mean, we talk about, you know, being in the environment and paying attention to it, but I mean, that's so vital that I really want to do some more of that too. One of the big things is a spotted eagle ray. They yeah. came in, and there are so many of them. There's probably five or six of them. They swim around every day. Yeah. And I would love to see more of them. Yeah. I guess yeah. more of everything. I guess. Yeah, we saw a manatee this morning. There are oh, no sharks yeah. all over the place. Yeah. We saw dolphins in the way back in oh, yesterday. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. awesome. Yeah. I see dolphins. Yeah. Yeah. A huge animals. turtle, too. Yeah. We saw that turtle turtle too. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Turtle. So. Cool. Yeah, we've got about two minutes left, David. Do you have any final 
questions for, for this, these guys? So if you, if you don't understand what Brian's saying, obviously, as scuba divers, they only have an hour to be down in the habitat. And so yeah, Francis and I are limited. These right, guys are Yeah, not. Liz and, and Grace will stick around. But uh, um, they only have a couple of minutes left uh, before they have to put all on the gear and, and get going again. Uh, okay, we have one more question from the audience, and then I'll, I'll wrap up. What's going to happen to Aquarius when this mission is finished? Yeah, and my understanding is that um, NASA has a mission coming up in about a week. Um, it's NASA and NEMO. So, so this facility is about the same size as the, um, the module in the International Space Station. Um, if you go outside from Europe, NASA has climbing walls. Um, they have all sorts of facilities to, to mimic being in space. And so they're bringing down a training mission. Um, after that, um, we're all kind of waiting with our fingers crossed. Um, I just want to point out, we've got a lot of the top side crew who are kind of coming to say goodbye to the last broadcast. Um, there's Allie, I'm trying to see who else is Mark. Yeah, Allie's coming right up. Yeah. She's been working a lot of sponges, and she has her, can you show her the, can you show us this thing? Oh, yeah. I've oh, noticed no. a lot of selfies <laughs> as you guys have been doing all this. Her, her, oh, her, the all her yeah. 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 So oh, she so takes water samples of those. Uh, there's Sarah, the best Sarah. tech ever. Right. <laughs> yeah, she's got the GoPro going. But she's the best web tech ever. Yeah. <laughs> I wish somebody could take a picture yeah, of Yeah, we got Billy time. over there. I don't know if you can see him or not. But. The, the good news is this is all being recorded via the internet. So they'll be able to see themselves uh, later That's on. Good. I That's guess nice. my, my final question, since we only have 30 seconds left yeah. or so, is just, uh, you know, for the four of you, if, if there was something that you wanted people to take from Mission 31, why, you know, either why this is happening or one thing about the science that they think is really important for them to learn more about, what would it be? What do you want people to be inspired by? Uh, since Fabian's out in the water right now, what do you think that this project really should, should motivate people to learn more about or do? Can I have two? I mean, my, my two. The first one is that science can be really, really fun. Um, we've been working our tails off, but it's incredibly fun. And the other thing is that what's blown me away working with this group, with Fabian's group, is I am really hoping we can kind of rekindle that connection and, and love of the ocean that all of us, all of us are talking about how Jacques Cousteau influenced us when we were, were kids. And I think this is, Celine and, and Fabian especially, are, are, are doing that. And I'm, I have two young daughters, Morgan and Molly, um, and I really hope that they have the same feeling that I did. Yeah, yeah, I feel exactly the same way. I think I said it earlier, just that outreach. I realized the importance of that, and I'm going to take this away and want to share with everybody, as many people as I can, how awesome this is and this whole experience is. With you guys. I wasn't listening because I was looking out. <laughs> so I just wanted to point out there was also Nick Cohart out there. He just got yeah. married, and he came right after his honeymoon to join us and do some research. So sorry, Meg. Sorry, Meg. <laughs> Well, so that's a, probably a great way to end it. We had a young man here who actually came to one of the... I want, we think of the... Since the ocean is right on our planet, sometimes we think, oh, we probably know all about it, but we don't at all, at all. The, the deep ocean yeah. is a huge mystery. There's so many creatures left to discover. There's so much left that the ocean has to teach us. And the scary thing is that we have the technology right now to destroy the ocean in my lifetime. So yeah. we need to you know, get a move on it and really explore the ocean. Yeah, well said. That's yeah. great. And, and you know, it, it's a fitting way to end because I, I gave a talk about Mission 31 at 1230 today, and, and one of the young people that's actually still out in the audience was really excited to hear that this was all going on because he had just read a book about Jacques Cousteau. And he was really nice. excited, uh, you know, hearing uh, all about this new mission that is happening and, and learning that, you know, we're still not living in cities underneath the ocean, but that right. just as Jacques Cousteau was encouraged, uh, sorry, encouraging all to think about, we have impacts on the world, and so we have impacts on the ocean and all the things that live in it as well. Uh, and so it's so exciting to know that you folks are down there doing new kinds of science that could never be done otherwise and maybe dreaming for the next chapter. Uh, so I think yeah. what we should do is all wave and let's give a big hand of our applause for our aquanauts um, and give them a big wave. And hopefully we'll see you guys soon. We wish you guys a safe trip back up to the surface. Uh, and uh, make sure that you read Liz and Grace's blog. They've been writing all about their experiences and, yeah. and check in on them. You can see it on mission31.com. Thank you so much, folks. We'll talk to you soon. Bye, guys. Bye, everybody. Bye, guys.
to learn before that it doesn't like lock on. Yeah. yeah. So we've lost our colleagues from Aquarius, but we uh, luckily do still have Chris around. And if you have more questions, he's around. He has been in the Aquarius habitat doing some of the exciting science. So uh, I want to just uh, say uh, if you have any questions, feel free to come up and ask him questions. Otherwise, have a great day. Thanks very much.